Welcome to Ask the Expert, a webinar series brought to you by the Children's Tumor Foundation. Today I am hosting Vanessa Merker, a PhD candidate in health services research at the Boston University School of Public Health. She also works as a senior clinical research coordinator in the Family Center for Neurofibromatosis at Massachusetts General Hospital. She graduated from Brown University with a Bachelor of Science in Cognitive Neuroscience in 2010. Vanessa's main research interests are access to and coordination of care for patients with rare diseases, particularly neurofibromatosis type 1, type 2, and schwannomatosis. She also does work on patient-reported outcomes and quality of life interventions. Vanessa's dissertation research seeks to understand the diagnostic diagnostic process for schwannomatosis in order to identify strategies to facilitate faster, more accurate diagnosis for future patients. Her work is funded by a Young Investigator Award from the Children's Tumor Foundation and a pre-doctoral fellowship from the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center Program and Cancer Outcomes Research Training. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you guys about all of the progress we're making in NF1 clinical trials. And I think the best way to think about this progress is to look a little bit at our past. Um, as far as I know, the first clinical trial for NF1 was conducted in 1993. It was a small trial to look if a cream called Cotifin could uh, improve itching and pain related to cutaneous neurofibromas. It really wasn't, though, another decade for clinical trials in NF when we started testing chemotherapy for plexiform neurofibromas. And then the Really, the new era of clinical trials has been in the past decade in which we've seen an explosion in clinical trials, both for plexiform neurofibromas and for things like learning disabilities and optic gliomas. Um, rather than uh, covering all of the clinical trials that have been happening over the past few years, I'm going to focus on just a few. Um, but before that, I do want to acknowledge some of the reasons behind why we've seen this explosive growth in clinical trials, and partially that's because of the increase in funding that we've had for clinical trial infrastructure. The Department of Defense has a neurofibromatosis research program, which in 2005 and 2006 started an NF Clinical Trials Consortium. This consortium is a group of hospitals, which now is 18 hospitals across the United States and Australia, that are all uh, set up together to do clinical trials specifically for NF. And a couple of the trials that I'll mention have been run through this consortium. So here's a list of the trials that I'm going to focus on in my talk. Uh, there's five trials that have been published all in the past year, uh, which I think are very exciting and uh, interesting trials to think about. And then I'll also try to give us a picture of what's coming in the future with MEK inhibitors, psychosocial programs, and certainly more that I can even uh, can cover or would even know about. But if I, there's only one thing I can leave you with to talk today it's that I want you to know there is a lot of progress to come, even if we can't see it now, and definitely a lot of reasons to be hopeful for the clinical trial um, progress. So since I said that I was going to talk about MEK inhibitors, I want to explain a little bit about what that means, since you might hear researchers or doctors talking about it. MEK inhibitors are a class of drugs which inhibit MEK. And what does that mean? So here's a picture of a Schwann cell. Schwann cells are the cells that wrap around your nerves, and those are the cells that become neurofibromas in people with NF1. In these cells, there is a pathway called the RAS pathway that leads to cell growth and division. And in this pathway, RAS is kind of like the gas pedal, and NF1 is like the brake pedal. And together, they work in concert to make sure that your cells grow and divide at the right rate. But what happens when you lose your, both copies of NF1? When that happens, we lose the brake, which means the RAS pathway gets overactivated, cells grow and divide too much, and they can become a plexiform neurofibroma. With MEK inhibitors, we're hoping to introduce the break back into this pathway, specifically by making sure that MEK uh, leads to less ERK, which leads to less cell growth and division. And if these inhibitors are working, that means we'll slow down the cell growth, or in the best case, we'll actually start to shrink plexiform neurofibromas. 
And we've actually seen great work in mouse models led by Nancy Ratner showing that MEK inhibitors could decrease the size of plexiform neurofibroma. So with that information, there was a clinical trial in humans for a drug called selumetinib. Selumetinib is a MEK inhibitor, and these results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine just at the end of December. The study was led by P.I. Brigitte Wiedemann, whose picture is here, and I want to emphasize that this was a small phase one trial. Phase one trial means that the main purpose is to identify the best dose of a drug and see how safe it is. The secondary purpose is to see if the drug is efficacious, which means in this case, does it actually shrink tumors? And I want to be clear that this drug is not yet approved by the FDA, which means it's still only available in research studies as we see if it works. So this particular trial covered uh, 24 children who were ages 3 to 18 years old, and they were treated for an average of two and a half years, although at the time this article was published, 19 kids were still receiving treatment and are continuing uh, to be studied. So since I said the main purpose was to identify a dose and the safety, I can tell you that they identified a dose that was very safe. Um, kids had some mild side effects, including rash or gastrointestinal symptoms like stomach pain and nausea. Um, but any of the more serious side effects were completely reversible. And so this was a safe trial. But the thing that was really exciting and why I'm talking to you is because of the effect that this drug had on tumors. So in this graph, every bar is one patient. And on the left side of the graph, you see the percent change in tumor volume. So if a person was at zero, that would mean that their tumor stayed the same size. Anything negative means their tumor shrank. And the thing that's really impressive in this trial is that for every single person in the trial, their tumor shrank at least a little bit. And in fact, 71% of people had their tumor shrink by at least 20%. 20% shrinkage is the criteria that we use in the in neurofibromatosis clinical trial world to signify a significant improvement. And what's even more impressive is that as of the time of this uh, article being published, no one had had their tumor grow by 20% or more, which is notable because about a third of patients before this had um, very fast-growing tumors, which made this very um, exciting results. Something that was also really exciting was the clinical improvements that were observed uh, in many patients while they were taking selumetinib. Uh, this picture shows one patient who had a plexiform neurofibroma in their left buttock, and you can see how the, this plexiform looked at the start of treatment, during month five, and during month 10. And many people saw improvements like this in disfigurement, pain, and motor function. I do want to emphasize, though, that these clinical improvements are anecdotal. That means the researchers hadn't planned to look at this outcome ahead of time and only noticed as the treatment was going on that it was something important. So it's going to be important for future trials to look at this prospectively, that is to pick measures ahead of time to track this and document it more accurately. So the work, this exciting uh, information about selumetinib has led to a lot of MEK inhibitor trials um, for other indications. I've listed here in the middle four different kinds of MEK inhibitors, so four different drugs that all work on the MEK pathway um, that are being tested or will be being tested for people with NF1 in the near future. There is a trial um, that is enrolling kids with different kinds of tumors, but including plexiform neurofibromas. Um, there are two trials that are looking at plexiform neurofibromas in adults. 
The first was run by the DOD uh, NF Clinical Trials Consortium, uh, and they treated 19 people ages 16 and up with it, the drug called PD0325901, and they'll be presenting those results in June at the Children's Tumor Foundation NF conference. So we're very excited to hear what they have to say. Um, the second trial for adult plexiform neurofibromas is currently ongoing at the National Institute of Health, um, where they are currently recruiting um, adults 18 and up who have inoperable plexiform neurofibromas that are either currently causing um, symptoms or have the opportunity or have the possibility of causing significant symptoms in the future. There's also two trials that are focused on treating low-grade gliomas, which are a kind of brain tumor that includes optic pathway gliomas. Both of these trials are looking at kids both with NF1 and without NF1 who have low-grade gliomas. One of them is very exciting because they've already published their phase one results. And in the phase one, which is the beginning smaller part of the study, they saw that 8 of 38 patients, which is 21%, had their low-grade gliomas shrink. Um, And then in another area that's going to be under investigation is dermal neurofibromas, which are also called cutaneous neurofibromas. This trial hasn't started yet, but it will be at the NIH and will recruit 24 adults um, who have a substantial number of dermal neurofibromas to see uh, if selumetinib uh, could treat those tumors. And I want to say uh, now that these numbers that all start with NCT are identifiers for clinical trials that are used on the website clinicaltrials.gov. So if you put these numbers into Google or into the clinicaltrials.gov website, you'll be able to get more information about these trials, including whether they're still ongoing at this time. The last part I wanted to mention about work with MEK inhibitors is work on cognition. Now, this isn't its own clinical trial, but an adjunct study that's being funded by the Children's Tumor Foundation and the Gilbert Neurofibromatosis Institute. Karen Walsh and others are studying cognition in other MEK inhibitor trials by giving people a a computerized battery of tests before they start treatment and during the treatment. And this is interesting because it helps them monitor if there are any side effects on cognition for any of these drugs, and it can help us see if there's any activity for MEK inhibitors in improving cognition, specifically in working memory or visual memory. Now, cognition is a very important area of NF1 because, as we know, somewhere between 30 and 65% of children with NF1 can have struggles with different areas of learning and attention. And we've been fortunate to have very good mouse models of learning in NF. And I put this picture up here because you might say, how can you tell if a mouse is learning? One of the ways we do this is with something called a Morris water maze. And in this, we have a cloudy pool of water with a hidden platform just under the surface. And you put a mouse into the water and they'll swim around trying to find where the platform is. As they keep repeating this task, they'll get better and better at finding where the platform is. And you can test the effect of drugs by seeing how it affects how fast and how well the mice do this task. And so with the mouse models we have that were um, generated by Alcino Silva at UCLA, we found that a drug called lovastatin might improve learning in mice. Lovastatin is a drug that's already FDA approved to treat high cholesterol, but also has some effects on the RAS pathway, the pathway that was the gas pedal that I mentioned earlier. Uh, In 2011, Maria Acosta and Roger Packer at Children's National Medical Center ran a small phase one safety study to see if giving lovastatin to kids could uh, improve their memory. And 
they did find some really interesting positive effects, um, which led to the design of two important trials, both of which were published this year. And I want to highlight that these trials were very well-designed trials, and that was important to see the true effect of lovastatin. So when I say they were randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies, what I mean is that half of the kids in the trial got the drug lovastatin, and half of the kids got a placebo, which is a sugar pill or an inactive pill. They were randomly assigned to get one or the other treatment, which helps make sure that the two groups are comparable on both the factors we can observe, like age and um, attention skills, and on factors we might not know about, meaning that we can fairly compare their results when the trial is done. The trouble... The trial was double blind, which means neither the doctors nor the kids knew who was getting lovastatin and who was getting a placebo. And this is important to reduce bias in the judgments that we make about how well the treatment is working. So in the first study, which was again led by Alcino Silva at, the, at UCLA, 44 people with NF1 ages 10 to 50 took lovastatin for 14 weeks. The main outcomes of this study were nonverbal memory and working memory, and while we saw a slight effect on working memory, a lot nonverbal memory and a lot of secondary outcome measures didn't really show improvement. And one thing we thought at the time was maybe the people aren't showing improvement because they didn't necessarily have to have a learning disability when they came on the study. Maybe they were too good already, and so there wasn't any room to improve. So to deal with that problem, the NF Clinical Trial Consortium ran a larger phase two study that specifically targeted kids who had showed problems in visual spatial skills or attention at the start of the study. And then they received treatment um, for uh, approximately three months. Uh, and unfortunately, they did not show any um, measurable increases in visual spatial learning and attention. And so you might ask, why did I just spend so much time to tell you about a trial for a drug that didn't work? And it's because it's important to know that that negative clinical trials are a fact of science, and they're not something to, while it's disappointing when things don't work out as we think, we still can learn a lot from these trials. For instance, we now know that we shouldn't give kids these drugs that aren't going to work and unnecessarily expose them to side effects. It also means we can move our research resources into other areas that might be more promising. We also learned a lot from running these clinical trials that we need better ways to measure cognition to make sure we're picking up on the drugs that are really going to help. There are many different areas of learning, like memory and attention, and for all of those areas, there's a number of different surveys or tests you could be used to measure e each area, and our job is going to be finding out which are the best tests to use. And I won't go into detail about this group, but there's a research group that's an international group called RAINS, which is working on picking the best clinical trial outcomes to use to help improve the success of how we do trials. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is non-drug clinical trials. A lot of people, when they hear the word clinical trial, assume that this means that they would be getting a drug treatment, but really it can be any kind of intervention. Some interventions that haven't used drugs in NF have included computerized training to improve attention or, and also um, physical therapy to improve muscle mass and muscle tone. But the one I want to focus on is psychosocial pro programs. We know for everyone that the mind and body are connected in important ways, and how you think and deal with stress can have a huge impact on your physical symptoms. And we've seen that from previous studies that a lot of people with NF1 have high levels of stress and worry. For some people, this might be a formal diagnosis of anxiety or depression, and for others, it's just normal worries about things like, what's going to happen to my NF in the future? How are others going to react to me having NF? Or 
how are, are my children possibly affected with NF? And we realized that we can teach people how to be more resilient and cope with stress better by adapting interventions that are used in many other populations to specifically address the areas that are uh, important in NF. So the first psychosocial program I want to talk about is called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. This is a, a, a program based on cognitive behavioral therapy that helps individuals engage in more adaptive ways of coping with pain. And Stacey Martin Perone led a, a group that looked at this therapy for uh, adolescents and young adults with NF1 who have plexiform neurofibromas and chronic pain. They did an intervention where over one weekend at the NIH, uh, these kids had two three-hour workshops learning ACT skills to help deal with their pain and still find ways to um, be able to practice the things that are important to them um, even while having this pain. They had a workbook to take home to practice their skills, and then for three months later, they were given surveys to see how they were doing. And what's encouraging is that the participants in the study uh, had less pain, and six of the ten of the people who answered the surveys were actually taking less pain medication than they had been before. Now, it's important to note that this was a very small study. There were only 12 people, so it's important to expand, and that work is underway. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more after that. But first, I want to say another psychosocial skills program that's very exciting called the Relaxation Response Resiliency Program, or 3RP. And work developing this intervention for people with NF is being led by Anna Maria Vrancianu at Massachusetts General Hospital. And she published, her and her group have published a study that was a medium-sized randomized trial, um, which was very exciting in that it used video conferencing software to deliver the intervention, by which I mean people were um, at their home computers and would log in to meet with six to eight other NF patients and talk to the therapist once a week for eight weeks. And for this study, participants saw improvements in quality of life, anxiety, and depression, which importantly were still um, apparent six months later. Anna Maria Vanciano is continuing this work, uh, expanding it to adolescents ages 12 to 17 with NF1 and NF2, and also with adults with NF2 and hearing loss by adding uh, real-time captioning and sign language translation to the program. So both of these studies are going to need to be replicated in bigger populations. And right now, and there's a phase three study of acceptance and commitment therapy that's currently recruiting people ages 16 to 34 who have plexiform neurofibromas and chronic pain. If you're interested in this study, you can contact Taryn Allen at the NIH. They should be recruiting for about six more months. Also, uh, Dr. Vranciano has received money from the DOD NF program to put on a large-scale online stress management study that's going to compare two different kinds of stress management programs, and this will be for adults who have NF1, NF2, or schwannomatosis. And if you're interested in that study and being put on a waiting list to know when it's going to start, you can contact her at this email address. For more information about NF research, you can read the Network Edge, which is a three times a year research newsletter that I write at the, for the NF Network, and you can find it at this um, address. Full disclosure, I am paid to write this um, newsletter where I summarize the research that's been going on in NF, both clinical trials and more basic research. You can also always check out the Children's Tumor Foundation NF newsletter Letter, which includes information about new research. And you can always go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is a government-run website that registers all clinical trials that are being conducted in the U.S. And that's where you can put in those numbers that I had that started with NCT to find out more information.
I want to thank the Children's Tumor Foundation and Seattle Children's Hospital for having me for this talk. And I also want to acknowledge all of my great colleagues at the MGH Neurofibromatosis Clinic, where I work. And it, it's been a pleasure to um, talk to you about this topic, and I look forward to having your questions. Thank you to Vanessa, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for Ask the Expert. Please remember to submit any questions you have and check back in two weeks for questions and answers to be posted here. Together, we will see an end to NF.